Well, good evening, everyone. So those who are here and those who are listening at home. So as Kathleen said, our topic tonight is to listen carefully to others. I think one can safely say that um, possibly the, the art or the skill of listening is a dying one. For, for many reasons. And, and your pledge even challenge you beyond that because it says to listen carefully to others, especially to those with whom we disagree. Hmm. That's, that's the challenge of that part of the pledge. And to consider their feelings, their feelings, and to consider not only their feelings but their needs. Um, so as we... We look at the, at, the, at the pledge, you know, carefully listening to others. Where I would like to start is that listening is not only a skill, but listening is an attitude. Listening is an attitude. And that attitude is an attitude of wanting to learn and wanting to understand when someone is speaking to you. So as a listener, the desire, the urge, the pledge, the commitment is to not so much reply as to get to know, as to get to know. And if we take that part of the pledge that says listening especially to those with whom we disagree, it becomes of paramount importance to listen to get to know. Because sometimes part of our disagreement is that we think that we know. And therefore, we cut short our listening. Because we assume that we know. So that's, that's part of it. Listening as an attitude doesn't only create only understanding our knowledge of what somebody is saying. But it creates a holy space. Why? Because when we listen well, when we listen well, we create communion, we create a bond. When we listen well, we affirm others in their dignity. We respect them through the listening process. We respect them. Have you ever been listened to? And at the end of the conversation, the end of you speaking and having been listened to, you felt much more affirm in your own self-esteem? You felt much more as a person, is that your self worth was almost elevated to what it's supposed to be, elevated to respect, not to arrogance, but to respect. That you felt that somehow this person really understands, this person really respected me. You know, a lot of times when we, we listen, we forget to listen, that listening requires an effort born of interest, concern, and love. I have to be interested in what you're saying, even as having that as a disposition, the disposition of interest. You know, there is, there is a difference between wanting to know in, in Caribbean language, for fastness sake, <laughs> and wanting to know because you want, you really want to connect. You know, doing this, I thought of the people in Dominica and throughout the islands, and not only Dominica. Suppose that is on my mind because it's right in your face. But to anyone who is in pain or seeking clarity, Anyone, sometimes we speak 
because we want to hear ourselves. And sometimes we don't realize that people who listen to us allow us to hear ourselves. I think that's the role of spiritual direction, for instance, is to help us hear ourselves so that we come to clarity. You know, so when we listen with that kind of disposition, it shows concern. And it, is, it becomes an expression of love, a very active, dynamic expression of love. So it's not a feely, mushy kind of sentimentality, but it evokes of us and from us a discipline. And that discipline is the discipline of silence. We cannot listen if we are not internally silenced. silent. Possibly, possibly, listening is one of those old contemplative skills that we need to learn. You know, Samuel, 1 Samuel, Samuel was listening. That's why he heard. And he listened again, and he heard a second time. And he listened again, and he heard. And his advice from Eli was for Samuel to continue that listening, to say, speak, speak, Lord. I am now listening, ready to listen. I'm now ready to listen fully to what you have to say. You know, people must feel when we are listening to them that we are ready to listen to f fully to what they have to say. And that, that, that attitude could only be promoted and could only be sustained if there is this internal silence that causes us to hush our mouths. Because if that is not so, we interrupt, and we know that too well. We interrupt. We answer back. We finish people's sentences. We even tell them we know what they're going to be saying. <laughs> we even tell them that. But when we are in that space of silence, that space of silence allows us not only to hear, but to reflect on what is being said. I think all of us in the Caribbean have come to a place where we have said to people who have listened to us, you got what I mean. You understand what I mean. You see what I mean. So that, that listening brings us not only to hearing, but to perceiving, to insight. Not all perception but what this person is really trying to articulate to us. And therefore, listening is a very, when we listen in, in dialogue, is very different than when we listen in debate. But I think, you know, because that, that, that the practice of listening is, is so compromised, that we listen more as if we are engaged in debate than in communion. Because ultimately, listening and communication is all about building communion. It's about creating community. It's about creating bonds. It's about breaking down barriers. That's why it is a skill of nonviolence. So listening is a tool of nonviolence. Listening is an instrument of peace building. Good listening, attentive listening, is a tool of creating bridges of nonviolence. To convey that listening presence. So let's look at what presence is all about. You look at a picture, and you get a sense of what presence is about. 
presence is total engagement with another person. And that engagement, if you look at the ones listening, if you look at his eyes, if you look at Obama's eyes, this totally engaged with that person, like there are no other persons in the restaurant. So when we, when we are present to people, we literally include them into our beingness, into ourself, into, almost into our souls. So that there is no difference or prejudice experience. There is a oneness that comes about, that happens. It is the oneness that came about with Jesus on his way to Emmaus. So the guys are running away and they're having this conversation and Jesus enters into that picture and he listens. And we know what that listening brought. That listening brought a sense of safety. They didn't, they didn't recognize Jesus. But it brought a sense of safety with this stranger that entered into this conversation. And by the way he listened, they came to much more clarity of the experience they, they had just had. Remember, they were running away from the center, Jerusalem, where everything had happened. They were running away from danger. They were running away from a place that had become marred. They had, with, 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 with sorrow, with disaster, with hopelessness. And they were talking about that. So that conversation was a hard conversation to even enter into. And one could only enter into that conversation by deep listening. Have you ever had to tell your painful story to another person? Or listen to somebody else's painful story? The only way we heal that through listening is by being present. Because if we just enter there, we will try to fix. Jesus did not try to fix. He listened and most likely he paraphrased and repeated. And in his repetition, what happened? The scripture told us something burned within them. Something happened within them. They came to light. They came to knowledge. They came to an understanding of the pain that they were running from. And why do I say that? Because they did not continue that journey. If you read that scripture, they returned to where they were running from. They returned right back to that pay, place of pain. They returned there. But before that, that safety that they felt became an invitation became an occasion of hospitality. Stay with us. Stay with us. When we create presence, we create safety for people to share their story. And, and, and that has to happen in our homes with our children. That has to happen in our offices with our co-workers. Does have to happen in, in, in religious communities, in lay consecrated communities. It has to happen on the street because only so a, a, a stranger will feel welcome. And we have lots of strangers these days. We have a lot of Venezuelans everywhere. And I often wonder, I don't speak Spanish, so I'm challenged, really challenged to light my eyes, I guess, and soften my muscles. That's not very hard, easy for me to do because I'm always thinking. I live in my head a lot, right? And, uh, and when I live in my head, I appear to be pensive. But, but 
you can't greet people with that. So how do you do that? So there is a kind of, there is a kind of listening that I, I try to do with my very face. Because, and we will talk about that, we don't only listen with our ears. And I think this picture is a good picture that tells us we listen with everything. Listening with an attempt to understand. That attempt to understand where I began. It's, it's, it's a humbling act. It's a humbling act. Because we do not know. I don't know what you're going to say to me. And I shouldn't want it to end a particular way either. Sometimes we want conversations to end a particular way. And sometimes I think that's why we pray, see what people are saying. Or we tell them we know what you're going to say. Or what you should have said was. And that's not listening. Part of listening basically um, evolves. Eh? It's an evolutionary process. It evolves because if you listen to me so well that I am becoming more clear in what I'm experiencing, what I'm feeling, and what I'm thinking, then even my decision changes. Even that, that happens. So there, so, so there is an evolution, evolutionary process as we listen. And, and, and that process is just coming from moving from darkness or confusion to light and to clarity. And, and that happens with the dynamic of how I receive, I receive the person speaking. You know, am I looking at my watch? Am I looking elsewhere? Am I able to see and engage the face that I'm listening to? Am I able to do that? The biggest communication problem is that we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. We listen to reply. Sometimes people don't want a, 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 a response from us. Haven't you said to people that you were speaking with, I really don't want a response? I see you're laughing. So, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I know parents at home must be saying, you know, how many times my teenagers have said that to me? Mommy, daddy, I don't want a response. I just want to tell you. So when they say, I just want to tell you, they're literally, literally saying, I just want you to listen to me. I just want you to listen to me. They just say it the other way around. I just want to tell you. But you just basically, they're begging you. I want to be heard. You know, to be heard is a, is a human need, to be heard. All of us have things to say. And if there isn't a space for us to be listened to, and therefore we cannot believe that we are heard, we feel stifled. We feel stifled. You know, sometimes I'm always cautious when people say to become a voice for the poor to become a voice for women, to become a voice for, for, for um, people at risk. You know, I always wonder, if we become the listening air of people at risk, we become the listening air of women, we become the listening air of the poor, I wonder if the poor and the women and the children won't find their voices. It's a serious question. It's a question I ask myself all the time. I wonder if they won't find their voices. I, you know, I wonder if because we, we don't listen the way we should, then people just feel muted by us. And that in itself, if that is the experience, 
I don't have to tell you by no. Now that's a, a violent experience. To feel that I can't speak because I won't be heard. It's violent. To feel that I have some, something to say and no one to hear it. In a civil society, where we're supposed to be a community, a family, that's violent. In a home, or possibly I should say in a house, where we're supposed to be a home, if that's not happening, we continue to be a house. So it, it, our experience there never becomes dwelling. Because dwelling is a, is, is a lovely word. Dwelling is not just I'm living there. I dwell there. To dwell is, is, is to find comfort. Not the opposite of discomfort, but is to find a space that's sacred. So when the, the documents of the church, Vatican II, speaking about the church, refer to the people of God, you know, a sacramental community, we make present God to the world. Small s, we make present God to the world. It is true, one of the things one of the, 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 the disciplines that we use, and I call it a discipline, one of the disciplines that we use to make God present to the world is the art of listening, the discipline of listening. So we debate, and as I said, we don't listen. If there is always debate in the house, then the house is never a dwelling place. And we know from a lot of research that even children in the crib, even children in the womb, respond to noise. And a lot of us only make noise when, we're not, when we feel we're not listened to. So when we feel we're not listened to, what do we do? We get triggered, and we get triggered into what? Defensive, defending ourselves. We get triggered into, into arguing arguing or raising our voice, think the, 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 the more we increase the volume, the more we escalate, people will listen. I don't know if you've had that experience, but a lot of times that's what's happening. Or what do we do? And sometimes to be heard because we're not being heard it becomes a shouting match and a controlling event. It's like we're shouting to the top of our voices, I need to be heard, I need to be heard. But we, we don't sometimes literally say that. What do we start doing? Instead of telling our story where we started possibly, we start to blame. You're not listening, and this is why you're not listening. Because you don't want to hear what I have to say. Because I have to say the truth, or I have to say what I feel, or I have to say what I think, or I have to say what is right for me now. You ever got that? Yes. So um, we do not make that extra effort when you're here, or you're here, um, do we make an extra effort when we hear a different accent? That's another difficult time to listen. When there's another accent present, it's a difficult time to listen. Um, do, we, do we really open ourselves to move beyond what you think, or I may think, is a barrier? Do, do we open ourselves to move beyond that? 
and it calls for a whole deeper kind of listening. And it's not only accents, that's one, but it's also listening to a different value system. Listening to a different value system. Um, your pledge says about disagreeing, and one of the things that could help us disagree very quickly is a different value system. So that different value system might be intergenerational. You know, my children don't think like me. You know, and I don't know where they come from. Okay, and we dismiss them or we are Catholic, but with a slightly different spiritual tradition. And we dismiss people, or we are of another religion completely. And we're not looking for common ground. You see, when we listen, we listen to hear common ground. We listen to hear similarities. We listen to see where there are agreements. We listen to see where we could negotiate. We listen to see where we could be friends and transcend the differences that would catapult us into a violent way of relating. And a violent way of relating here, we're not talking blows, but we're talking exclusion. Where difference of values, difference of thought, difference of skin color, difference of whatever else tend to separate. But particularly values, because I, I work a lot with, with, with young people. And, you know, us older people criticize their music. But if I were to ask a lot of older people, what of the music you're criticizing? They can't tell me, they just say, it's a lot of noise. It's a lot of noise. But they can't say, they can't tell me the lyrics, they can't tell me the name of the song. They put every single thing in one barrel. So I ask myself, you know, have we listened? Have we listened? Is there anything good in the lyrics? Is there anything lovely about the beat? Is there, is, is, can we help, could, can we listen in such a way that all younger people could educate us in their music and we could educate them in our music? Could, could our listening ever bridge a gap that tends to separate families so much these days? Could our listening ever bridge that gap? Or do we just say, that's them. That's what they listen to, a whole set of noise. And as the young people say, we diss them. We just, we just kind of, that's it. That's it. So we have to learn then the skill. It's a hard skill. It doesn't come naturally to everybody. And it's not something we pick up in a day. It's something we have to, so your pledge, your pledge calls you beyond just saying that word, just saying that phrase, I pledge to listen carefully to others. Embedded in this, embedded in this is a commitment to a discipline of learning a new skill. And many skills as a matter of fact. Many skills. Else, this pledge will remain something on the paper and will become something that you say, but not something that you live. In order to implement this pledge, in order to live this pledge, you're invited to a conversion. You know, I think sometimes we think conversion is just... Um, <laughs> Changing from sinful ways. That's one kind. 
Have you looked at conversion as being stretched to the max? That you have to turn around? That you have to turn around? That possibly the first conversion is the way you think of something, so you have to change your paradigm completely. And then you have to change all patterns. All patterns. Sin is an old pattern, right? Well, some of these things are old patterns. And we can't chuck it up to, this is how I am. This is how I am. I saw for 50 years. I saw for 55 years. I saw for 23 years. This is how I am. So take me as you get me. I think that's a cop-out on growth. I think it's a cop-out on transformation. I think it's a cop-out on conversion. So maybe my call here is the discipline to be focused. Could I be focused in front of the person with whom I am now listening, to whom I am now listening? Could I be focused? Could you be my sole engagement? Could I be respectful enough to you to tell you that right now I really don't have the time to listen and what you have to say is so important that I want to make the time to do that. Could we say that to our children at home? Could we say that to our spouses? Could we say that to our elder parents who sometimes is at home all day long and have no one to speak to? So when you come home, they're very excited. And they're happy that someone is home. Not only a body has returned home, but someone to speak to. Someone to speak to. I think a lot of our older family members, our parents, uncles and aunts, are home. And part of the loneliness is not the fact that you're not home and you're, you're, you have a job. They understand you having a job. They know what you having a job means for them and their livelihood. But I think the loneliness is the lack of the discipline that we have in not listening. And listening doesn't have to be long. And sometimes I think we, we just think that the elderly talk too much. They will talk too much. They'll give me the long, long stories. But sometimes they're only giving us the long, long stories because we didn't hear in the first place. So they didn't feel heard. And if they have not felt heard, anybody who has not felt heard will want to repeat. It's, no, it's normal for you, it's normal for me, and it's normal for them. It is not a function of age. It is a function of need. And therefore, we have to look at that. So am I living a, a passive, violent life? Or am I actively living a nonviolent life in the way I engage? And, and, and that's a challenge. That's a challenge. That's a, that's a, a, a real big challenge. And it is to the two ends of the spectrum, for our little children and for our elderly. Because we say to little children, you talk too much. Just go sit, take your toys. Now we tell them, go take your iPad. <laughs> just, just play a game. What is much more memorable than sitting on your parents' lap looking up in their eyes, still looking down at your eyes, and you telling them a little story. I hope everyone listening and everyone in this room has had an experience of that, that you can go back to, that that's part of your relationship history, that you would want to pass on to somebody else, because it is so memorable for you. So that skill, that skill, learning that skill of listening, the focus, the discipline, the, 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 
hushing the mouth and not interrupting, right? Um, not asking questions. Unless it is questions of clarity, that in itself is a discipline. That in itself. So I really want to understand what you're saying to me. So could you repeat it? Or I'm going to tell you what I heard. And you tell me if that is what you intended me to hear. That's how it should go, really. Because once I put somebody else by giving them a different question, guess what? I have taken them off the conversation. And I have now put them in another place. Even when somebody says, I feel sad. If I say to them why they feel sad, I have changed the conversation. If I say to them, tell me something about your sadness, I have not changed the conversation. I have kept them focused. Because now they have to tell me about their sadness. Not why are you sad. You, you get the difference? So, so, to, so to listen, to listen is really um, a, a, a discipline. Receiving the message being communicated. You know, to let people know I'm receiving it. So sometimes it's, it's paraphrasing. Sometimes it's saying, you know, but receiving that message. Just look at those faces. There is some, there's a, there's a, 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 a dynamism. There is something happening there. You, you, you see the engagement. You see the, re, the reception of what's going on. The receiving of it. And we have to be clear. We have to be empty ourselves if you're going to do that. I can't be thinking about, Lord, you know, it's 12 o'clock. I have to go and eat. You're talking so long. <laughs> you know? I can't be, think, I, I can be thinking about, you know, I, I'm, on, I'm on my way to Mass. You know, so what happened? You're keeping me back. It is much more polite and much more nonviolent to say to the person, you know, I'm really enjoying our conversation. I'm enjoying listening to you, right? And I don't want to hurry this up. However, I have to go to mass so we can continue this conversation some other time. Rather than they see all the fidgetiness and they see this and they see, you know, the, um, <laughs> the stress and they see the, the it, you know, the, the lack of engagement. Rudeness, really. Rudeness. Disrespect. So let's talk about, you know, um, give me five. You know? So... What do we do with our eyes when we speak and when we listen? Is it really there in a listening, engaging way? Or is it all over the place? You know, or to say to some, I was speaking to someone actually today, um, and the person is in Canada, and I was speaking to them, and a bird, a different Herman bird, came across with a brown, with a brown tail edged in white, and I'd never seen it on the property before. As a matter of fact, I'd never seen it, you know? And I've been to Acerite quite a number of times, and I think I know hummingbirds a little bit. So I said to the person, I'm really sorry. I just got very distracted by a hummingbird. After a while, after a while, if you're really trying to, to listen, you know when you're distracted. And you know what she said? I thought something had happened. She sensed it. I was lost for a minute. She sensed something had happened. So what we do? Closing the lips so we don't interrupt and we don't make all those things. You know, using our ears to really, really listen. Um, we listen with our whole bodies. Eh? We listen to our whole bodies. There was one psychologist that said, when you listen, you must become one total ear. One total air. Well, one total air, if you understand that all the other parts of you are parts of you listening. If you don't understand that, then one total air is not enough to listen. But if you understand that as your entire body becoming a total air, then you're onto something. Because even your, your, your gesticulation means something. You know? So am I fed up with you? Or am I, wow, see a little bit more about this soon. 
Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to hear you clearly. Wait a minute. So let me just tell you what I've heard. Okay? You see those hand movements open. I'm ready to receive. Wait a minute. I need to step back. Not you need to step back, but I need to step back and tell you what I've heard. This is really exciting. And it doesn't go only with my, my hands, but it went with my eyes, right? So, and, and tone of voice, of course. So to really let people know that you're listening. So good listening promotes nonviolence and peace building. It promotes nonviolence because it does just the opposite. It creates community. It promotes nonviolence because it affirms it promotes nonviolence because it dignifies. So therefore, you experience much more of your own dignity as a person when you're really well listened to. It makes it safe. And if it is safe, then guess what? Then we speak our truth. Then we don't feel vulnerable we feel invited. We don't feel scared. We feel accompanied. We're not a stranger. But we are a common brother, a common sister. We're not disrespected by looking at time, we're included and com become part of time. Have you ever finished a conversation with somebody and you've said to them, this was valuable time? You, you ever think about what we say? This was valuable time, which means that we acknowledge that sometimes in life we listen to people and it is wasted time. It is not valuable time. This was, this was valuable. This was, this, and and, and we, we even say it in the Caribbean in a stronger way. We say this was time well spent. This was time well spent. And we all know what that means. This was time well spent. It had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with negotiations of a higher position in the job. It had nothing to do with none of that. It had something to do with, I'm going to use a strange phrase, valuing each other. That is what it had to do, valuing each other. And we don't spend enough time, quality time, listening in such a way that we come to a place of the process itself becomes an experience of valuing each other. So that is a challenge within this. That we will know that it is happening when we are beginning to experience the time spent listening to someone becomes an experience of being valued and valuing. That's it for me. Um, any questions? I find one of the things is we live such a busy life. Mm -hmm. That's an excuse. I will say it. It's an excuse for me. So to really listen. Uh, once I, I said to the person, well, you know, I really can't hear what you have to say, which I guess is the wrong word. Um, and I saw that other person got offended because mm -hmm. I would not take the time at that point in time, mm -hmm. but I knew I wouldn't be able to mm -hmm. function. So I guess it's to try and say maybe what I wanted to do was not that important and I should really have spent the time listening because you can offend people as well when you don't take the time when they want you to take it. I mm -hmm. don't know if that makes sense. Yes, it makes, it makes sense. It makes plenty, plenty sense. Um, I, I, one experience always comes back to my mind. When I was novice director in my own congregation, there was a, a, a German, a Austrian novice doing her novitiate with us. And um, she came, and I was in the middle of writing out a retreat 
And you know, there are times when you just get to this real creative part and it's like eaten. You know, it's, it's there. And I, and I was just writing and I was just, you know, that was the days before computer. And I was just writing and it was just, I mean, I was just exploding with, 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 with creative energy. And, and she came into the room and she said, um, could I have the car? And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. And she came back. I'll never forget that. She came right back to me. And she said, what just happened? What just happened? And she called me to it. She said, what just happened? And I said, I told you, take the car. She said, yes, but not so. And it taught me two things. One, I have to protect myself, but two, I have to be respectful to others. I had this open door policy. I still kept the open door policy, but I developed a different question. So when one of them would come to me, I would say, is it a life and death? Could it wait? Especially if I was doing something creative and I couldn't stop. And they would say, no, sister, it's not life and death. We could have this conversation this evening. Or they would say, yes, it's life and death. When they said, yes, it's life and death, trust me. Trust me, as God make day, I will just stop. I don't care. I mean, just life and death made me stop. And then I would take care of it. And most times, it was just a few minutes. They just wanted a very short answer. No conversation. And, and that's how life and death is. Life and death is emergency. Right? Emergency anything is, is short. So I think, I think we have to learn how to do that. At least that is what I'll pass on to you because that really taught me. And it taught me something else. Because I know uh, possibly if it was a West Indian, another Caribbean person like myself, I would have experienced that person's disappointment in me and anger and never be told. Mm -hmm. And never be told. So it, it taught me also that, mm -hmm. which I was very grateful for. Articulate your need. I, I'm really glad you, you, you shared that example because I come from a family where you stop when somebody, a member of the family, the inner family allowed to disturb anything. Mm -hmm. The discipline that you're describing there, if somebody I held close exercised that discipline to me, what I will hear is that I'm not important enough to you for you to stop what you're doing mm -hmm. and hear me now. Mm -hmm. But in your sharing, I recognize it as a discipline. And therefore, I think going forward, I will not take an insult. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes. That's a wonderful insight. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Because our patterns and our family patterns um, predispose us in particular ways to listen. And we have to look at the family patterns that we have inherited, that we still have, that are blocks to the way we listen. Um, I think one of the worst things about modern technology today is um, people rather using WhatsApp or text messaging rather than having telephone calls or personal face-to-face -face conversations, especially where there's long gaps between the messages. Um, you don't know what the other person's doing, what other distractions they've got. So I think WhatsApp and texting is a, a conversation breaker, really. Right. And... Um I would like to rephrase that. I think it's here to stay. And I think, and I think it, can be, it can serve us very, very well. I think what we need to do is not allow it to replace human interaction. That human interaction remains primary. And human interaction, um, that's one kind of human interaction. But there is a human interaction of I'm seeing a face. Um, I'm, I'm seeing an eye and not on another device, right? But you are in front of me and I'm seeing that rather than, you know, on another device, you know? I think that has to happen. Yeah, and it's no excuse for not doing it to say, well, you know, I, you know, I WhatsApp you three times today or I this, you know, or I sent you, you know, so what you, so what you're looking for, <laughs> you, you know? This is, this is not enough. You know, the, the nurturing doesn't happen. The, you see, there's a difference, eh? The communication happens, but the nurturing doesn't happen. And, 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 and communication is supposed to help us feel nurtured. That's why all babies in every culture start, they, they start out cooing in life. 
and we, we call back to them. Ooh, you know, they, they make their noises, and we do, the, we do the same thing back to them. Well, I, I, I just want to say that I think we agree that this was time well spent. Yes? <laughs> so let us, let us thank Sister Julie. <laughs> and of course, tomorrow.